Hola, hola, amiga. It is that time of year where the school year has begun. And for many of us who are just starting off with sending their kids to school for the very first time is a mix of feelings. Personally, this is the first time as a parent, as a mama, that we'll be sending a child to school for the first time. Dieguito will be starting pre-K-3. It's technically more so of a part-time preschool experience. So he'll only be in school for about two and a half hours. I would say closer to three hours a day. But it's still going to be a big thing because he will be entering in a public school. All right. In a school in which he will see big kids. And if you're not from Chicago... For the majority of the public schools here in the city, these schools run from pre-K through 8th. There is no middle school. For me, as a CPS student, I didn't have a middle school experience. It was literally just elementary school from K through 8th. Now, CPS has implemented a preschool for 3-year-olds and 4-year-olds. And so Diego will be in a 3-year-old program. And I am very excited But I'm also nervous as heck. Alex and I are both, we just have a mix of feelings because I know that this will be a huge transition and a huge milestone for Diego, but also for us as well as parents. If you are a mama who is currently going through los nervios of taking your kid to school for the very first time, I completely get it. And this could be either pre-K-3, pre-K-4, or kindergarten. These three sort of grades are very significant for our kids' lives, especially if they've never have gone to a school before or if they have ever gone to a daycare for that matter. And for us, Diego is going for the very first time in a school setting. We've never taken him to daycare full time. Yes, we've taken him to like mini programs that only meet once a week for 45 minutes but that's nothing compared to a daily class. And so with all that being said, I thought, why don't I invite a mommy over to the Viva La Mommy podcast and for her to share not just her experience in taking her kiddo for the very first time to school, but also a maestra who experienced it all from the other side. And so... I am very thrilled to have Juliana Schombert again on the Viva La Mami podcast. She was with us on episode 25, who shared about how we can advocate for our bilingual children, especially in the school setting and out there at home. And so now that she is a mama of two, she was a mama of one, but now she has two, Uh, a toddler and a little one who just wrapped up the newborn stage. She will be sharing us her perspective as a parent and how she has prepared her niña for preschool for the very first time. And she also shares very great tips as an educator. So as parents, we can have a better sense of tranquility, ¿verdad? Without any nervios, So that way we can have a successful start to the school year. If you're a mommy who's taking your kid to school for the very first time, whether it be preschool or kindergarten, I am very thrilled to have Juliana once again, who will be sharing with us on how to prepare our preschooler or kindergartner for the first day of school. Welcome to the Viva La Mami podcast. I am your host, Jessica Cuevas. I am a mother of two on a mission to help redefine the meaning of motherhood as a modern Latina mom. Motherhood can be a complex journey, interwoven in two identities that often make us feel ni de aquí ni de allá. Viva la Mami is committed to providing you with knowledge, tools, and support to navigate the challenges and triumphs of motherhood as Latina moms. On the show, we'll be discussing culturally relevant topics that will help inform and empower you in whichever season you are in on your motherhood journey. 
We'll be joined by Latina moms, experts and professionals who can offer advice, practical tips, relatable stories, and honest conversations. So bring your cafecito as I invite you to be a part of this space as we create comunidad about the exciting and challenging parts of being a mommy. Ahora, vámonos. Hola, hola, Juliana. How are you? Good. How are you? I am good. Thank you so much for being here again. It is so exciting to bring guests back on the show, and that way we can see where you're at también. But in this time around, uh, we're talking a little bit more of a different subject. The last time I had you here, we were talking about how we can advocate for our bilingual children, uh, which was episode 25. So I'll make sure to share that in the show notes for our listeners who want to know a little bit more about you and raising bilingual children. But this time around, it's more so about the transition to school and sending kids to school for the first time as parents of preschoolers or kindergartners. I think it's a great opportunity for you to talk about your expertise as a former educator, but now as a current parent going through this yourself as well as I am. And so I'm excited to talk about this because this episode will be aired around the time when kids go back to school, although some for the most part have already had their first day of school. But I know at least for me, we won't until like two weeks. It'll be okay. August 26th. That's all what I know. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, my daughter starts school on Monday. So and today, oh my gosh. And yes, this time us now a mom of two, I have a three month old boy, baby boy named Henry Julian. And my daughter, Joanna, is going to start pre-K three, which is something new that the district is doing. So pre-K usually starts at four years old, and then it's kinder at five or six. Well, they have pre-K three. So she's actually going to the elementary school with the big kids, and she's three. Okay, so let me introduce myself. Well, my name is Juliana. I'm 37. I live in Dallas. I am an only child. I was born and raised in Bogota, in Colombia, by my very strong single mom. I would say that it was my mom along with my aunt and my grandfather who raised me. And I really owe all of my accomplishments to her. Sadly, she passed away in 2017, so she never got to see me as a mom. And now my kids don't know what a abuelita is, which is so sad. Mm -hmm. So I can't replace her, but we have a strong family unit where, like, my very close friends are actually, I call them tias. Oh, that's your tia Francis and your tia Romina. <laughs> and yes, I came to the U.S. when I was 15 years old. And my tias had been in the U.S. for many years. And they helped us get established here. So it was my mom and I. I started working since I was 16 years old. And it was in high school that I fell in love with teaching because they had a class called Elementary Teaching Internship. And that's where I, I worked in a kindergarten classroom and I was like, this is what I want to do. So I've been doing that for, oh my gosh, 20 years. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh my gosh, 20 more years. That's, yeah. And yeah, that's a short intro about me. Yes. Yeah. Something, something interesting too is that my husband is, Cuban and Cambodian. So, so my children are Cuban, Colombian, and, and Cambodian. I'm like triple C's right there. <laughs> triple C's, yes. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know about that. No, that's great. And And coming from education, you know, I really wanted to have you in this episode, but Porque también you can talk about that perspective and that lens as an educator and someone who has learned about childhood development and, you know, that kind of aspect. But also as it relates to parents 
and how you've experienced it, you know, working with parents, working with the children, going through that transition. And now that you are a parent yourself, actually experiencing that. And me too, you know, I also have a three-year-old as many of uh, my listeners know, and we're going to take him to pre-K three también. And that's also part of the school district. So it's not like it's a daycare, you know, and you put them in pre-K three or through the park district. It's actually from the school district también, but it's only half day. I don't know if yours is half day también. So they, they had options of half day at other schools, but the school that I'm sending her to, it's full time. So it's like eight to uh, three twenty, and they do have a nap. They have a nap, but but yeah, just like the other kids that are going to school, she's gonna have the same schedule. Wow, that's awesome! I wish they had that option. At least that our school like they they do have that option but it's only for specific populations student populations like for example diverse learners for the most part they offer that for full time but not for you know non DLs i kind of wanted diego to go like full time though because <laughs> This boy needs to go out in the world but también i'm like okay we can have like two parts of this experience so Being that it is the start of a new school year, and especially for parents who are kind of preparing themselves for this new transition, can you give us about, I don't know, like three to five tips on how parents can prepare their kids for their first day of school? And this is only specifically for either preschoolers and kindergartners. Yes. Yes, I can. (laughs) So I... You know, this summer I was like, how do I prepare my child for, she actually goes to a little preschool. She's been going to the, to this little preschool daycare for a few months now. So she's used to like being away from me, but I was like, school is different. It's like, she's going to be with older kids. Like she's, just this tiny little thing, (laughs) this big school, how do I prepare her? And so on Instagram, I saw a post from a teacher and I was like, oh, she's bilingual. She's in Dallas. Oh, let me, let me go to her profile. It turns out she's a psychologist. She's a kindergarten teacher, dual language, and she works at the district where my daughter is going to. So her name is Rosi, Rosi Jabur. And I connected with her on Instagram and I said, okay, I know what they need as a teacher from all, I can tell parents how to prepare their kids academically and socially what they need to have. But now as a parent, like, what can I do at home? Mm-hmm. You know, and we came up with five tips. The first one is to prepare in advance, which means going to the school together before that first day of school because you're getting your child familiar with the environment and that can ease anxiety. Mm. So even if you can't go in, you can just drive and, oh, that's that's going to be your school. Mira esa esta escuela, que bonita. Mira y hay un bus. And you can talk about it and kind of so that it's not like, oh, wh- where are we going? Like, what is this? So that's the first step. Second one, establishing a goodbye routine, which I did not do when I took my daughter to her very first day at this preschool. I thought maybe I can just sneak out because I'm going to cry. I don't want her to cry. And and (laughs) talking to Rosie, she was like, no. You never want to do that <laughs> because that that's what, like, you don't, you don't want them to feel like you left them. Okay, so always say goodbye, but make it short and do a ritual. Like, it's something as easy as, like, okay, cuando te dé un beso en tu mano, tu mamá va a estar contigo. Like, if you read Un Beso en Mi Mano, that talks about, the first day of school of a of a little mapache. I can't think of the word mapache in, in English. So, ma, yeah, mapache. <laughs> I don't know what. 
So something small. It doesn't have to be like, okay, I'm going to leave. Okay, I'm going to leave right now. You just have to say, okay, it's time to say goodbye. Give me a hug. I'm going to give you a kiss in your hand. Remember, I'm coming in the afternoon to pick you up. I did not do this with my daughter the first day of school because I was crying. <laughs> and I didn't want her to cry. Well, guess what? My daughter was fine. She she was like, she didn't even notice I was gone first. Second, the teacher sent me pictures and she was like, no, she's been playing. She's fine. And I had so many, like a mix of emotions. So another tip that we're going to talk about is like, you have to stay calm, <laughs> which is hard. Um, but but yes, yeah, so establishing a goodbye routine, something short, a goodbye ritual, a hug, a special phrase. That, that's going to make the farewell easier. Okay. Um, then three, this is good. Talk about expectations. Mm -hmm. So discuss with your child what you're going what they're going to do at preschool. Don't tell them something that's not going to happen. Oh, you're just going to play all day. Everything's going to be fun. Just say realistically what to expect like yes they're gonna make friends they're gonna learn how to share and take turns they're gonna have new jobs in the classroom this helps them build excitement so with Rosie I was like okay what can we do to to talk about like what to expect she said well she has a book she created a book that goes through the whole routine, like from the morning to to the night, like not night, but morning to where they are picked up from school. Oh, okay. So if you read it, through the three days before, they're going to start learning like what to expect. Mm. And the routine, it actually helps you too, because you're like in your head as mom, like we're always so busy and we have to okay, I have to wake up at this time so I can cook breakfast, get them ready, you know, get my other baby ready, my husband ready. <laughs> so with this book, you talk about what they do in the morning, how they prepare for school, when they go to school, what do they do at school, and then when mom or dad picks them up. And so you want to read this book two to three days before school starts, not two to three weeks before, because that actually increases the anxiety because you're, you're talking about it so much that your kid is like, okay, my mom keeps talking about this big school and, mm. and like me nervous because there's like, why, what is the big deal? You know? Yeah. So then you do it two to three days before. The next one is be patient and available. So after school, your child is either going to tell you everything that they did or most often they're, you're going to ask them, how did it go? And they're going to say, oh, bien. <laughs> and you're like, okay, <laughs> like how do I get them to talk? So be patient and start asking more specific questions. Like, did you like the lunch that I gave you today? Or what did you have? Did you make a new friend today? Or can you tell me uh, your teacher's name? Did you do something kind? Now, that might be for older kids. But something specific, like did you go out to recess? What was, did you read a book? What was your favorite part of the book? So, but be patient because at first they might not tell you. Now my daughter tells me everything. Like I just have to say, I ask her specific questions, but she's already like, well, my friend Max was making bad decisions. <laughs> so she tells me what her friends are doing. I know her friends' names. I ask her, who's your best friend? Did you play at recess today? So be patient, but and available to talk about their feelings because that helps validate and it can help with the transition because it's not now you're making that home to school connection like okay this is 
this is important. I'm not just going to school because I have to, but this is something fun. And this is something that my mom wasn't with me, but I can tell her what I did. Mm-hmm. And and then the last one, is, which is hard, is stay calm because your demeanor can influence your child's emotions. So if you stay positive and calm, even when you're feeling a little nervous or anxious, that's going to make your child feel safe. Like, mm-hmm. okay, my mom not going to leave me somewhere where I'm not safe or you know, I see my mom is calm and and this is not a big deal. I'm I'm feeling the same way. Gotcha. So yeah, those are five tips. These are some great tips because you usually hear about preparing them a month in advance or two to three weeks in advance, como dijiste tú. And I think because they're so young, I mean, their brain is just very present, right? Like they they don't know the the essence of time necessarily where it's in two weeks, I'm going to go to school. Like they don't know that. <laughs> And so I appreciate you sharing that book. And I will make sure to share that in the show notes so that mommies can look for it too, um, because I think that would be helpful. I'm even going to get it because yeah. I think that would be very helpful. Yeah. Yes. And, and and I can tell you a little bit more about the book, which it's amazing. It's 12 pages long. It's all in Spanish. That's another thing. The whole thing is in Spanish. That's great. But what Rossi made, which I love it, she actually made it customizable so that you can add pictures, like real pictures. So for example, it says my first day of school, there's a place for you to put a picture of their school. So then they're more connected. You can put pictures with their dad or with you or with their siblings. And then if you want it in any other language, you can just translate it. And and this is a free book. It's on our Instagram profile and wow. it's on La Mami Bilingue or Entre Letras y Colores. That is Rosie's page. And yeah, all you have to do is comment and then we'll send you the the link. It's, it's in Canva so you can edit it. Oh, that is, cup- that is awesome. Oh my gosh. I, I love it that you get to personalize it. Like it makes it more realistic. Yeah. And, and yeah, like And I think that's what we have been doing, you know, whenever, you know, we had to submit like specific forms or like next week, we're actually going to send over the immunization records and all of that. And so I'm like, okay, this is another great excuse to to bring Diego, like the, the school clerk already knows him. (laughs) Oh, yes. Yes. And el otro día, you know, she gave him cookies. And so now I'm pretty sure he's going to ask her for cookies next time we go. (laughs) Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Okay, so the story on how I chose the school where Joanne is going right now is as a teacher, you know, I was like, you know what, I'm going to become a substitute in the district (laughs) where my daughter is going to, and I'm just going to go to schools and be like a secret shopper. And (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm going to go to school, see if I like the school because I want to know the administration. I want to know how the teachers are. And I was pregnant. I was like 30, 30 weeks pregnant. And I was like, no, I don't care. I have to go. And it happened. There was a kinder bilingual substitute job for like two weeks, two or three weeks. And I fell in love with the school. And I was like, oh, my gosh, and they're opening a pre-K-3. And now I already know the teacher. The The nurse was my sister-in-law. So I was like, no, this is perfect. Wow. So, so, yeah, so having a connection with the school, I was like, how do I join the PTA? Like, I already joined the PTA or PTO, or the, the parent-teacher organization, parent-teacher association. Um, yeah, because I'm going to be – involved. That's another way for you to be calm, right? Because you know what's going on. And now as a parent, I'm no longer a substitute. So I have no connection to, I can't go and substitute. But now as a mom, if you join the PTA or the PTO, 
you'll know what's going on. And, and the common goal is for kids to, to create a community. A school is a community. Right. And so you have to be part, you have to be involved. Yes, that is awesome. And and this can be in any capacity, right? I often think about my parents because they were working all the time. They couldn't be involved. And I know that that is a similar case with many. But as long as you have that ability to and sh- like at least share to the teacher that you are available to talk or that email is always available um, because that really? allows – the educators to obviously have this constant communication for parents too. And so I think that is a, an, also another great way to be involved. I know that for Diego school specifically, because it is a dual language uh, school, they mm-hmm. also have like a bilingual parent PTO sort of thing. And so mm-hmm. it is very specific for bilingual students, which I'm kind of curious how that looks like with the bilingual versus the monolingual one. I hope that no. it's not segregated <laughs> because yes. that can be okay. it. But I am going to look into that because, yes. yeah, I think it's important to also advocate for the bilingual students too. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So if, yeah, if you feel like there's room to grow in the bilingual department in the district, then even if you're not a teacher, you can make a difference as a parent. Mm. And you brought up a really good point. Not everybody has the time to be part of the PTA, just in any capacity that you can, and that it's not more stressful for you because that's not the point. But it's it's the level where you feel like you know what's going on at the school, like you have more information. Yes. Yeah, so many great benefits. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And so let's kind of shift gear in terms of, I guess, taking a couple steps back, you know, like, okay, we already know how to prepare our kids for the first day of school. But once they get there, I think a lot of emotions run through our head, a lot of like things run through our head, like whether if our kid is prepared or not, at least for us with Diego, he hasn't been in a school setting or in daycare or anything. He's been 100% home. And so I wonder (laughs) if he has acquired the skills for him to be ready for a school setting as much as we try, you know, to keep him engaged and involved. And we try to give him all these random activities that are age appropriate. I, I honestly don't know how the curriculum looks like, right? I'm not an educator necessarily. And so I do suspect that I'm probably going to have the sense of mom guilt if <laughs> Diego doesn't meet certain standards. And so how can moms overcome mom guilt if they think that their kids aren't ready for preschool or kindergarten? What are your thoughts, especially as an educator? Yes. Okay. I felt the same way when Joanna started in the preschool. I said, I cannot see my child objectively because she is my child. So I can't, I don't know if she's behind or if she's ahead. I don't know. And my experience has been all the academic skills they will learn. So they don't, so don't worry about, oh my gosh, they don't know their numbers from one to 10, or they don't know the letters or, or they don't know how to cut with scissors, or they don't know how to hold a pencil. None of, don't worry about any of that because that's what we do in kinder. That's what we practice. As long as you're working with the teacher on their skills, it's, it's a growing process. So you have to see preschool, pre-K, and kinder as a starting line, not the finish line. So they're just starting. Mm. So if you change your mind on how you see that, that's they don't have to be academically ready because they will learn that. Now, when it comes to social skills, I think the most important one is to practice being independent with you. For example, can they can they go to the bathroom independently? They don't need to learn how to tie their shoes. Just buy them shoes with Velcro. <laughs> and teachers will say that at the beginning. They already told me that, like, please, no shoelaces. 
Mm. Especially when there's three. And and practice taking turns, practice having them tell you what they need. For example, if they don't like something. I've been teaching my daughter to say, I don't like that. Please stop. That has been very helpful. I said, if somebody doesn't stop, then you tell the teacher. Mm -hmm. So practicing that they tell you what they need. That's the most important social skill. Not taking turns and sharing because if they're an only child, like how do you, if they're just with you, it's hard. Yes, you can practice, but it's hard if you only have one baby and if you have or one child. And if you have two and they're so far apart, they're working on other skills like how to be kind and how to not be rough with their brothers or sisters. So trust your gut because every child is unique. And if you have the option of like, okay, I don't think my child is ready to go to school like five days, then find options for, okay, maybe can I do half time a few days a week? Can I start, can I do play dates with other friends? Not not five of them, but maybe just one to so that they can practice sharing, they can practice talking about their needs. I always told my students that we have a bubble. So everybody has a bubble. That's your personal space. And nobody's supposed to touch that space. So they're not supposed to be touching you or Mm. so teaching them like we all have a bubble. And if somebody's in your bubble, you can say you're in my bubble. (laughs) Yeah. But yes, I was worried about like what oh I don't know. Does she know her ABCs and her all of that will be they will practice all of that. And they are in pre K they will be in kinder we tested them at the beginning of the year, but they were already in our classroom. We just wanted to know where they were. Like the parents didn't even know that like the results because we use those results to know, okay, this is what they know. This is what we need to work on. Mm -hmm. So just read to your kid. You're already doing all the things that you do at home are preparing them for school. Um, Interactions, the bedtime routine that you have, when you read a book to them, when you cook and they see you or when they're helping you cook, all of that is, it's the social skills that they will need when they enter. Yeah, that's that's helpful, at least for me and for many mamas, because we see this on Instagram and social media in general about kids knowing how to read at like four years old and or they know how to write when it's like, whoa, like I thought that that's a kindergarten <laughs> matter. And and I think that because we are so influenced by what we see, especially out there in social media, we always think that we're either doing a bad job or we're not doing enough. And so that mom guilt comes and it overtakes with like what we're already doing. And I think all of us are doing a great job. If we have the sense of mom guilt, actually, a mama just told me this not too long ago. If we feel mom guilt, that means that we are doing a good job. So yeah, you know, or you're already thinking like, how can I help? What what do I do? Mm-hmm. And that is parent involvement. As a teacher, a teacher will see it as like, okay, you you are very involved, and we can work together. So remember, you work with your teacher, and so she will give you more information about specific things like, okay, we're going to start the letter sounds and your child is having difficulty with this. Can you practice at home? So she will be with you on the academic aspect. So I also see that on Instagram and it's amazing that a child can read at three, but it's not uh, a definite of like, okay, does that mean my child is behind? Or does that mean that that kid is really ahead? Because they might be missing other skills that you don't see. Just because they read doesn't mean that they are ahead. Mm-hmm. It's amazing, but it it does not determine, it's not the whole child. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, you're so right. I, I see that on Instagram a lot. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it's important for you to, 
like with my daughter, I wanted to do, I was, I taught kindergarten for four years. I wanted to do all this reading. I created this whole little mini books with each letter of the alphabet. And because I was teaching kindergartners how to read. And I've been wanting to use those with my daughter and they are not developmentally appropriate. So I'm like, no, I have to remind myself she's three. And if she's going to start showing me signs of readiness and then I can use it with her. But just, I think a lot of teacher moms also feel that like, oh, I am a teacher. So my, my, my daughter or my son should be reading, right? Because I was a kindergarten teacher or in not necessarily just work on the other skills and every child is unique. Yes. Thanks for sharing that. And there was actually a question from a listener who wanted to know, how do we know when our kids are ready for school? Like specifically for the kids who are in between age, for example, if they're going into kindergarten and their birthdays fall in early fall, right? So they're either five or six. Like, how would you respond to that for a parent that isn't sure when their kids should be ready for school? Yes. Okay. So as a teacher, I can tell you that I never looked at birthdays Mm. and they were not like, oh my gosh, this one just turned five and this one is five and a half. Like I just knew this is my kindergarten class. And they all started growing at different rates. I never had a child that I had to say, oh, this kid is not is not ready for kindergarten. Now, as a mom, I can understand feeling like I don't know if my child is ready. So if you are questioning it and if you feel like I don't know how they will do at school, like they don't know how to communicate with others, or I feel like they're too young, they still need more time with me. I need to make make them feel more independent. Like they need to go to the, the bathroom. They need to know how to dress themselves and they're still not there. If you can wait a year, yes, just you can do it. It's not going to, again, remember that kindergarten and pre-K and preschool are a starting line and not the finish line. So it's okay if they start at six, because like I said, as a teacher, I did not look at the six-year-old as different than the five-year-old. And teachers don't see, well, I'm talking about me, but I was more excited about their birthdays. If they were like on a holiday, (laughs) like I would, if they were in the summer, then we would do half birthday celebrations in my classroom. So I was more worried about the celebration of their lives than, oh, this little child is not ready for my class. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. It's more so are they developmentally ready versus if they're ready based on age? And sometimes, yeah, that doesn't matter. And and thank you for saying that because I could see that being a big concern, but I think that sometimes you just have to listen to our mommy gut and then go yes. from there and ask those questions. Yeah. Yes. And, and I was extremely shy as a child. So don't take, if your child is very shy, don't take that as a sign that they're not ready. Mm. That doesn't mean that they're not ready. They just meet, they just need more interactions. Maybe they prefer one-on-one. You are your child's first teacher and you're the only one that knows your child more than anyone. So you only know if they're ready or not, but don't base it on academic skills. I think that's, that's the more helpful tip I have. Don't base it on if they know reading, if they know how to cut, if they know how to hold a pencil, that that's what they're going to learn. Thanks so much for sharing that. And so we mentioned a lot about this huge transition, especially by you sharing those tips. For me, at least, like what I'm (laughs) having a hard time is like, oh my gosh, I I can't already imagine it being like chaos. I know that this is going to be a huge transition because, like I said, Diego hasn't been outside of the home. And so now that he's going to be in a different space... Now, granted, this is only going to be half day and half day. It's like a two, almost three hour class day. Like it's nothing. I'm barely going to 
come back and then leave the house again to like pick him up. But it's a milestone. It's a milestone. Yeah. They're doing something new. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And so how can we support our child with those transitions, especially from being in a completely different setting or having a whole different structure like school? What are your thoughts? I think the best way to support your child is by preparing them emotionally. So talk openly about school, what to expect, the fun things that they will do. So Another thing is establishing a consistent bedtime routine and you can do that. You, this, you can actually start two to three weeks before just kind of waking up at, so that you're waking up. Like, for example, we have to wake up at six so that by 730 we can leave the house. So I know that her bedtime has to be early, early and, you know, not what we were doing before, which was like, oh, you can go to sleep when you go to sleep. Now we have to really be on a bedtime routine because that's going to help them. They're going to see those routines in the classroom. Like every day when they, when they go to school, they're going to put their backpacks in the same place. The first day of school, the teacher will tell them it's all about routines, establishing Okay, you come into the classroom. What is the first thing that you do? Okay, you take off your backpack. You bring your lunch here. Everybody has a name tag. Um, you sit down in the carpet and you read a book or you go to stations. So establishing a routine, it's very important because they will make the connection of like, okay, when I, at this time we eat dinner, I go to sleep, I wake up, I go to school, and then they see it as just part of their transition in their day. And it creates a sense of normalcy. And your child picks up on your emotions. So so try to stay positive, not, you know, oh, we have to do this because they pick up on those things, you know. And the good thing about establishing a bedtime and morning routine is that they're not going to come to school already rushed. That's not a nice way to start the day, you know, when you're rushing. and But when you're like, okay, now it's a normal thing that I wake up at six every day. You enjoy more, enjoy, enjoy your day more. Right. Yeah. And that's something that we've been doing. It's, it's just so been very difficult because our kid is super strong-willed, you know, <laughs> So it's it there's like this power struggle that we're still going through and, and that's toddlerhood with that. Yes. And so now I'm like trying to think like actually my husband and I were talking about this we we have heard about these visuals of like yes, yes. so that way he can take on the power quote unquote to check off like the things that he's supposed to do in this routine. And so we're going to do that. I just have to print out the the stuff. But yeah, it, it, it just depends on how your kid is. If they're very reluctant yeah. on getting ready, I think, how do we establish a routine that best fits them? So that way we don't end up struggling. And remember, establishing a routine is hard. Once it becomes a habit, it's like, oh, okay, it becomes a habit. You don't even think about it. But establishing the routine is hard and not every day. You're not a robot. So even though you have the routine, days are not the same. Like even, even if you have your visuals and, you know, we don't have time to do this. We're going to skip that. Like sometimes I don't read at night because I'm like, okay, I have to prioritize sleep. Like, mm -hmm. no, we're going to go to sleep. <laughs> no, but I didn't read. Okay, we'll read it in the morning. We'll so you have to be flexible. And as moms, we know, yes, that's motherhood. You have to be flexible. So don't be hard on yourself when you're establishing the routine. I think we tend to be like, no, we're doing the routine. It has to be like this. And, and it just, no, just modify things. If you see your, your child is struggling with doing everything, maybe you have too many things at night. So take one thing out. I started journaling with Joanna. I don't even journal for me, but I was like, I'm going to start a journal with Joanna. And every day I'm going to ask her a question. I'm going to write it down and she's going to draw a picture. And I try to do it at night, but I'm like, 
sometimes I can. So I'm like, do I know we're going to do it? Do you want to do it tomorrow? And she's like, yes. Okay, we'll do it tomorrow. Let's go to sleep now. So don't be too hard on yourself because I know it's hard. It's not it's not easy to establish a routine. Mm-hmm. You mentioned that you used to be shy. And I think that as parents, sometimes we're very worried for the little ones who are shy or who are usually anxious. También. And so how can we help our kids to get away from their comfort zone? Yeah. And that way we can help them build the sense of resilience and self-advocacy. También. So if you have a, a shy kiddo, you are not alone. As a former teacher, I know I've seen it all. Mm-hmm. So the key is really to be patient and understanding. So let them know that it is okay to feel a little bit scared sometimes. So you can start small, maybe a play date with one friend instead of a big group, and then celebrate the, their little wins, like saying hi to a neighbor, or you know when you go to the store, say hi to the lady, say hi to the, the señor. <laughs> and remember that building resilience is like building a muscle. It just takes time. They're not gonna. They're not gonna come out of their shell just because you took them to one play date. So keep doing it. Just keep cheering them on and they will surprise you. And it's funny because kids act differently at school than at your house, at your home. I would tell the parents at parent conferences, oh my gosh, you know, fulanito, they talk a lot. They're always making jokes and and they're like, really, my son? They don't, they don't say anything at home they you know and I tell them what did they do and they say oh no and they they've done so much things during the day so they will surprise you yeah I think it definitely it it makes sense to take the time that you need and también like I like how you said that building resilience is like a muscle and it's a matter of time and so yeah sometimes we just have to be patient and it's very easy to compare ourselves with others. It's easy to compare our kids with other kids. And we often wonder, are we doing enough? Are we doing a good job and all of this? But at the end of the day, it's essentially meeting where our kids are at and then go from there. How can we best support them where they're at right now? And then, like you said, they're eventually going to flourish. And that's just part of their development. So yeah, so thank you for sharing that. And so you are going through this process, like you shared, you said that your daughter is starting school on Monday (laughs) at the time of this recording, it's Friday night. So it's, I'm sure it's nerve wracking. Tell us how you're feeling though. Like how have you established, you know, this preparation, especially as a teacher and now she's going to a big school. How how is that yes. going? Definitely a roller coaster of emotions. I'm excited for her to start in a new school, make new friends, because as a teacher, I know how amazing those early years are. But at the same time, it's like, wait, my baby's growing up. It's it's bittersweet, you know. So it's yeah, it's bittersweet. I'm really excited. I think I'm more nervous than her. So I'm trying to, that's why I emphasize the tip number five, which is stay calm. Mm -hmm. I'm trying. So tomorrow we're going to read the book about what to expect. Yesterday we had meet the teacher night and that's something that schools do. So the week before, usually the week before school starts, on that Thursday or Friday, it depends on the district, but they have a meet the teacher night where you can meet the teacher. For me, it was like, okay, I have questions, but I don't know, like, wh- what time is their nap time? Wh- what does their schedule look like? Is there a teacher assistant? How many kids are in her classroom? And uh, one thing that I would recommend that I didn't do. So if I could do it again, I would just write down my questions for Meet the Teacher Night because you you think about you, your 
son or your daughter going and you're like, okay, they're going to meet the teacher. And, but you don't think about you, like you, you, you are also nervous. You're also anxious. What's going to make you feel calm? What information? And yeah, my daughter met her. She knew, she already knew her name. I now know that there's a teacher assistant. I took a picture of her schedule so that I can keep the nap time the same on the weekend so that it's, it like flows better. Mm -hmm. Um, Her schedule flows better, but Yes, I'm it's a mix of emotions. I'm excited. I'm I'm anxious to to put her in a big school and that I can't be there like I wish I had a camera if I was like a fly on the wall that that I would love that. I just want to be a fly on that wall, but this is building their independence. They're becoming interdependent, right? Not independent, but inter. They're always going to need you. They're always going to need someone, but they're starting to test those independent, like they're becoming big kids. Yeah. So, yeah. And isn't that well? And actually, we were just talking about this before we recorded this episode that our kids are little pandemic babies. Like, now the yes. pandemic babies are starting school, whether if it's kindergarten or preschool or pre-K three. And so it definitely gives perspective about just the madness that we all went through when we were pregnant, when we had our kiddos during the pandemic, when we were in isolation. And now it's like, whoa, we're taking them out into the world. <laughs> and in a way for me, I'm I'm excited that at least for me as a new mom, you know, where my oldest is three mm-hmm. years old, like I didn't have to go through the hurdles of keeping your kids at home during the pandemic, right? Where they didn't have the ability to be in this social setting. And and unfortunately, mm-hmm. there has been a lot of issues with kids and students overall who went through the pandemic from an academic and social standpoint. But now that our kids are that first wave of that post pandemic world. I'm hoping that there's not much of a struggle. <laughs> I would say at least for a parent selfishly. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, yeah. It's so interesting how, when they were born that had, I mean, that affected all of us in ways that we're still learning mm-hmm. and we will mm-hmm. learn with time. I remember Joanna being born in, we did not go out of the house for the first year. I was scared to go to a mommy and me class. I was, I was like, the world is ending. I'm just going to keep my baby with me. And, and so going from that to like, okay, now I'm taking her. Now I'm taking her to school. That's a big deal. And so I think our, this generation of COVID babies will be different because they were not taken out of school. Mm-hmm. They were actually with us more, right? So they, I don't, I think it, it's more of a struggle for us an adult, as adults, because I'm still on the mindset. Like I, I just heard my husband was telling me that Noah Lyles, sorry, mm-hmm. that he, he got COVID and I'm like, oh wait, is that still like, I thought it was done and it's still going on. And so I think as moms of COVID babies, we went through such a, we were going also through postpartum, you know, we were, it's just, it's a big change for us. It's a big milestone for our kids. I think it's going to be easier because they never been at school. They were not taken out and they were not doing online classes. Right. They don't know what online classes are. Right. This is this is their oh, okay, elementary school. It'll be interesting. I, I hope that they're more caring because we cared a lot for them during the pandemic. And so we'll see. It'll be interesting. I wonder if there will be some research done about that in terms yeah. of how the caregiving made an, a big impact in their preparation for a social setting like school. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's interesting. But, yeah, for me, too, you know, I'm also going through that transition. Like I said, Diego's also starting school. And 
And I think he's excited. We are excited. I think he needs this. He is such a social butterfly. But I do worry because he is a social butterfly (laughs) that he may be the talker or the one who perhaps struggles with with authority, if you will, you know, because he's such a strong willed kid. And I worry that he may struggle with like the rules and like specific routines that are set in place. Mm -hmm. But I know that essentially he's going to adapt, you know, and, and I don't think that that is a reflection on us, but I, I am going to make it clear with the teachers during that meet and greet that we're going to have and be like, okay, this is Diego, just so you know, (laughs) and everyone, at least the people that I've met, like some of the administrators that I, we've already met, like they, they love him. So I'm like, okay, good. We're, we're making a good yeah. impression. Pero vamos a ver. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, you know, as a, I think as a teacher, all I wanted the parent to say was like this, I'm, I'm Diego's mom and I'm here. I'm here. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, because it's so funny the the, parents that introduce themselves like that to me I mean their kid was fine like no problem no and they're like no but you know they do this at home I thought they were going to be like this completely different you know maybe they are the classroom leaders or you know they it just it's so funny how they act so different in in class my daughter when she's at home She's very independent. She just plays with her things. She can play for hours in her in her kitchen and with her Legos. And she likes little things and details. And and then at school, she's like, Max didn't do this. And Adeline didn't do that. And she was making bad choices. And I told this person, and I'm like, Joanna, you do it. You just focus on yourself first. And then <laughs> because... I'm like, oh, how is she going to be in school now? Is she going to tell the teacher all the things like that all their kids are doing? She's going to be a teacher's assistant. <laughs> yes. Is she going to be a teacher assistant that the teacher doesn't want? You know? <laughs> oh, yeah. that's so exciting. Yeah. Well, I look forward to hearing more about Joanna and her first day of school and this year. So please let's let's stay connected. But Juliana, where can people follow you and learn more about the resources that you share? Because you do share a lot, especially in the bilingual parenting world. Yes. Okay. So if you want, if you have less than a year old baby, I'm going to be sharing more things that I do with my my little Henry. And if you have a three-year-old, I'm going to be sharing a lot of things that you can do with a three-year-old, specifically in Spanish, on La Mami Bilingue on Instagram. If you are a bilingual educator or an educator in general, we are actually working on our new website and we're rebranding. We're doing an application for teachers. It's going to be big. It's still a work in progress, but that's going to be on bilingual marketplace on Instagram. Okay, great. And I'll make sure, make sure to share that in the show notes. And that way uh, people can follow you and connect with you. Uh, Pero Juliana, thank you so much for taking the time. I know that it's, it's an exciting time, a very, you know, we're all nervous. We're all anxious about the first day of school, but I think you have provided a really good foundation for us, especially us mamas who are going through this for the very first time. And yeah, I think I feel like the sense of confidence now. <laughs> so okay. Thank you. Yes. okay. That's what, that was my goal because just know that you're not alone, that it is normal to feel anxious, to feel like is my child right, to question all these things. Again, if you're questioning that, that means you're doing a good job. So, so remember that you are not alone and everything is a process and that we're going through this process together. Yes. All right, Juliana. Well, thank you so much for being here. Mujer, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to listen to the Viva La Mami podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, will you do me a favor and follow the podcast and leave a rating and review? 
Hitting that follow button and reviewing my show will allow other mommies like you find this podcast. Your review will also tell me if you enjoy the show, so I would truly appreciate your thoughts. Don't forget, please share this podcast con tus amigas. Also, make sure to follow me at Viva La Mami on Instagram or visit vivalamami.com. Please note the information shared in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be taken as professional advice. Okay, mujer, thank you for joining y nos vemos in the next episode. Thank you.